world is tonight. Kabul occupied. Taliban says that the decades-long Afghanistan war is over as Kabul falls into terrorist control. Haitian shake-up. A major earthquake in the Caribbean leaves thousands dead in Haiti. Improved infrastructure. Indian Prime Minister unveils trillion-dollar infrastructure plan as the Independence Day celebrations end. Pet rescues. Animal lovers pledge to take care of pets who lost their owners due to COVID-19. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off tonight's coverage with reports on the fall of a nation as Afghanistan falls into the hands of Taliban. After de decades-long battle to gain control over Afghanistan, the Taliban has finally achieved its goal of taking over the country. Citizens were seen leaving the capital due to fears of being killed. Crowds packed the international airport in Kabul in a chaotic scene on Sunday after Taliban insurgents entered the Afghan capital and President Ashraf Ghani fled the country, saying he wanted to avoid bloodshed. As night fell, local television One TV reported that multiple explosions were heard in Kabul, which had been largely quiet earlier in the day. It said gunfire could be heard near the airport, where foreign diplomats, officials and other Afghans sought to leave the country. Aid group emergency said 80 wounded people had been brought to its hospital in Kabul, which was at capacity, and said it was only admitting people with life-threatening injuries. It was not yet clear where President Ghani was headed or how exactly power would be transferred following the Taliban's lightning sweep across Afghanistan. Their advance accelerated as U.S. and other foreign troops withdrew in line with President Joe Biden's decision to end America's longest war launched two decades ago. The spokesman for the Taliban's political office told Al Jazeera on Sunday that the war is over in Afghanistan and that the type of rule and the form of regime will be clear soon. Two senior Taliban commanders in Kabul said insurgents had taken control of the presidential palace. Some local social media users branded President Ghani a coward for leaving them in chaos. American diplomats were flown by helicopter to the airport from their embassy as Afghan forces melted away. The U.S. Embassy said in a security alert that, quote, the security situation in Kabul is changing quickly, adding that there were reports the airport had come under fire. A source who was at the airport said there were hundreds of desperate Afghans waiting for flights, with some scuffles among people unable to get a place as departures were halted. With more updates on the situation, U.S. President Joe Biden approved additional military forces to go to Kabul to help safely draw down the American embassy and remove personnel from Afghanistan. U.S. President Joe Biden said on Saturday he authorized 5,000 U.S. troops to Afghanistan to help draw down personnel as Taliban forces overtake the country. In a lengthy statement, Biden defended his decision to send the additional American troops in order to safely help evacuate personnel from Afghanistan and issue a warning to the Taliban saying that any action that put U.S. personnel at risk, quote, will be met with a swift and strong U.S. military response. Biden's decision to go ahead with Trump-era plans to pull U.S. forces out of Afghanistan has given way to a Taliban resurgence as Afghan forces crumble. But he's not backing down from that decision, explaining Saturday, quote, one more year or five more years of U.S. military presence would not have made a difference if the Afghan military cannot or will not hold its own country and an endless American presence in the middle of another country's civil conflict was not acceptable to me. The Taliban have swept through much of Afghanistan capturing a major city in northern Afghanistan on Saturday and drawing closer to Kabul, where Western countries scrambled to evacuate their citizens from the capital. 
over in the Caribbean, Haiti's hospitals were swamped by thousands of injured residents after a devastating earthquake reaching 7.1 on the richer scale struck the country, killing at least 1,297 people as authorities raced to bring doctors to the worst hit areas before a major storm hits. As the small island's nation of Haiti comes to terms with yet another devastating earthquake, the death toll from the 7.2 magnitude quake continues to grow. Haiti is still clawing its way back from a seven magnitude tremor which killed tens of thousands 11 years ago. Saturday's earthquake flattened hundreds of homes and buildings, with the southwestern part of the island bearing the brunt of the damage. Rescue efforts are continuing as teams dig through the rubble to find survivors, with international powers quick to offer aid. The U.S. has sent vital supplies and a 65-person search and rescue team. They will join local forces, but their efforts are likely to be complicated by a tropical storm due to hit the island on Monday. Further to the weather, the political climate in Haiti remains unsteady following last month's assassination of the country's president. New elections were earmarked for September, but have once again been pushed back to November. But Saturday's disaster is likely to make that task harder still. In Asia now, India will launch a 100 trillion rupee national infrastructure plan that will help generate jobs and expand use of cleaner fuels to achieve the country's climate goals. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Gayathri Gunasekar, who joins us now from Delhi in India. Gayathri. Yes, Shanali. India on marks the end of its 75th Independence Day celebration with a colorful and traditional flag lowering ceremony at the Atari Wag border in northern Punjab state, at which Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced the implementation of an infrastructure bill. The infrastructure program called Gat Shakti will help boost productivity of industries and boost the economy, Modi said during his speech at the Independence Day celebration in New Delhi. While Modi did not announce details of the plan, he said the plan will help local manufacturers compete globally and create new avenues of future economic growth. Boosting infrastructure in Asia's third largest economy is at the heart of Modi's plan to pull back the country from a sharp economic decline worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic. The Prime Minister also set a target to become energy independent by 2047, saying the goal can be achieved through a mix of electric mobility, moving to a gas-based economy and making the country a hub for hydrogen production. Modi said the country spent more than 12 trillion rupees annually on energy imports and becoming energy independent was critical as he also announced the launch of a national hydrogen mission to boost the government's clean energy plans. Back to your Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Abdul Dharan, a World News Special Correspondent, Gayatri Gunasekar, reporting from Delhi in India. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back and still in Asia, South Korea held a ceremony to mark the anniversary of its liberation from Japan's colonial rule in 1945, a holiday known in Korea as Gwanbok Chol. In his address to the nation, President Moon Jae-in said that the institutionalization of peace on the Korean peninsula will benefit the two Koreas. President Moon Jae-in said that the two Koreas can make a model for unification and contribute to the prosperity of the whole of Northeast Asia. Speaking Sunday at a ceremony to mark Liberation Day, Moon said that the division of the Korean Peninsula is the biggest obstacle to growth, prosperity and peace. Moon's final Liberation Day address was focused on a vision of peace for the long term, rather than making new overtures as he has done before. Cross-border relations have been on edge with North Korea cutting off communication lines just two weeks after restoring them, in protest against joint military drills by South Korea and the U.S. There has been speculation about an inter-Korean summit, albeit virtually, or a surprise turnaround at the upcoming UN General Assembly next month. Sunday's ceremony was held at Culture Station's Hall 284 in Central Seoul, a historic site symbolic of Korea's fight against Japanese imperialism. To Japan, President Moon said that South Korea has always been ready to talk to settle pending issues. 
Ties between the two countries have been strained over issues such as Tokyo's wartime use of forced labor and sexual slavery, as well as its export restrictions on Seoul. Moon said that historical issues need to be solved in accordance with international standards. On COVID-19, Moon announced a new inoculation target, saying the 70 percent of the South Korean population will be fully vaccinated by October. Currently, around 11 percent of the population have received both doses, while 36 percent have got their first shot. Moon vowed to spare no effort to bring the first domestically developed vaccine to the market in the first half of next year, and for South Korea to become a global vaccine production hub. The embattled Malaysian Prime Minister resigned due to the unpopularity after a tumultuous 17 months in power marked by his government's poor response to the COVID-19 pandemic and growing division within the ruling coalition. Malaysian Prime Minister Mayuddin Yassin is set to resign on Monday, according to news portal Malaysia Kini. This came after he lost his majority due to infighting among the ruling coalition. If confirmed, Mayuddin's resignation would end a tumultuous 17 months in office. But it will also bring more uncertainty to Malaysia as the country grapples with surging COVID-19 cases and an economic downturn. Mayuddin's grip on power has been precarious since he took office in March 2020 with a slim majority. Pressure on him mounted recently after some lawmakers from the United Malays National Organization Party the largest bloc in the ruling alliance, withdrew support. It was not immediately clear who could form the next government, given there is no clear majority in parliament, or whether elections could be held during the pandemic. It would be up to the constitutional monarch, King al-Sultan Abdullah, to decide what happens next. Muyiddin will submit his resignation to the king on Monday, according to Maud Ratswan Maud Yusuf. A minister in the Prime Minister's Department, Malaysia Kinney, reported on Sunday. Over in Europe, in Germany, hundreds of protesters marched past the European Central Bank headquarters in Frankfurt to challenge the role the financial sector plays in climate change. For more on this, we have other than the World News Special Correspondent Inuka Ponzo, who reports, joins us now from Cleve in Germany. Inuka? Yes, Shinali. Activists are targeting billions of dollars worth of investments in climate damaging projects and fossil fuels like coal, oil and gas. The demonstration was organized under the banner of the Friday for the Future Move, its first action after this week's United Nations report called a Code Red for Humanity. The protesters held banners with messages such as The Planet on Profits, Do Not Burn Our Future and Stop Investing in Climate Killers. Fridays for Future is focused on promoting a system change towards an economy that does not focus on the exploitation of people and resources, but on social and ecological needs. Protesters were seen burning an effigy of the bank's logo, thus contradicting what they protested for. Climate change has been a hot topic these days, especially in southern Deutschland, since last July was said to be the hottest month recorded in human history. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Inuka Ponzo reporting from Cleve in Germany. Now taking a look at the COVID-19 pandemic that's spreading worldwide. The spread of the coronavirus Delta variant has forced China and Israel to ramp up vaccinations and Australia's state of New South Wales to go into lockdown. In Australia, lockdowns were widened on Saturday from just Sydney and the capital Canberra to the whole of the state of New South Wales. The authorities battling to contain the Delta outbreak said they'd experienced the most concerning day of the pandemic so far. After months of pursuing a successful COVID-0 strategy, they're now clearly struggling with the more infectious variant. In China, the authorities are continuing to vaccinate children between 12 and 17. They say more youngsters are getting ill with Delta. And on Friday, the National Health Commission reported that 770 million people are now fully vaccinated, which is 55% of the population. And restrictions have been tightened. People have to wear masks in indoor venues and crowded outdoor ones, such as shops. In Israel, the health ministry warned on Saturday that the number of people hospitalized will now double every 10 days. In a month's time, it forecasts nearly 5,000 people will be in hospital. Prime Minister Naftali Bennett has now called for vaccinations to be given day and night, seven days a week. Over 
in North America, the U.S. has not said when Canadians are allowed to enter the United States. The mayor of Niagara Falls in Ontario hopes the border opening will help bring back tourism. The rush is on to return to Canada, packing roadways to border crossings from coast to coast. We love Canada and uh, we've been waiting for months to get in. From Washington State, Michigan, New York to Maine, vaccinated travelers are again crossing the northern border, not just on the ground, but packed planes too. The mayor of the usually bustling Niagara Falls, Ontario, says tourists are needed to revive struggling businesses on his side of the border. Niagara Falls is one of the most popular tourist destinations in both countries. 14 million tourists flock to the American and Canadian Falls every year to take in the breathtaking scenery. It's sentiment shared among some businesses on the U.S. side. This parcel shop owner has packages that have been sitting on shelves for more than a year, waiting for stuck Canadians to pick them up. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Israeli forces on a raid in the occupied West Bank exchange fire with Palestinian gunmen. Israeli police said and a local Palestinian official reported at least four Palestinians were killed. Thousands of people took to the streets of Lima to demand the resignations of newly elected President Pedro Castillo and the head of the Council of Ministers Guido Bellido, who is under investigation for allegedly supporting terrorism. Japan deployed 230 rescue workers continued to search for two local residents that went missing after a landslide in Uzen City, Nagasaki Prefecture, following torrential rains. China held a welcoming ceremony for Russian military team to participate in the International Army Games 2021 in Kuala, northwestern China's Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. The wildfire blazed in hills west of Jerusalem, forcing the evacuation of several small outlying communities as clouds of smoke drifted over parts of the city about 10 kilometers away. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau took to an immense risk and gamble by calling for a snap election in the hopes that his Liberal Party will be able to grab into another term. This is a really important moment in Canada's history. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau on Sunday called an early election for September 20th, saying he needed a new mandate to ensure voters approved of his Liberal government's plan to recover from the health crisis. As Canadians know, this is a moment where we're going to be taking decisions that will last not just for the coming months, but for the coming decades. And Canadians deserve their say. That's exactly what we're going to give them. Trudeau is betting that high vaccination rates and an economic rebound will help him prolong and strengthen his position as prime minister. Newly released data shows 71 percent of the country's eligible population is fully vaccinated. Trudeau spoke after visiting Governor General Mary Simon, the representative of head of state Queen Elizabeth, to formally request the dissolution of parliament. Polls suggest the Liberals will win their third consecutive election, but may not regain a majority in the House of Commons. Trudeau currently has only a minority of seats, leaving him reliant on other parties to govern. The Conservatives and New Democrats have in recent days condemned the idea of an early election, saying there was no need for it and describing Trudeau's call as a power grab. A parliamentary majority would give Trudeau the ability to follow through on his priorities of fighting climate change and supporting those who suffered most during the health crisis. And finally tonight, animal lovers in Indonesia are helping pets left behind when their owners tested positive for COVID-19 and were hospitalized or placed in isolation. Gladys the pit bull spent two days home alone and without food in Indonesia's capital, Jakarta, before volunteers found her. The country is battling one of the worst COVID-19 outbreaks in Asia, and Gladys's owner is one of many who have tested positive. Pets are sometimes left in limbo by owners who are hospitalized or put in isolation. However, animal rights group Animal Defender is working to put sick and anxious pet owners at ease. With uncertainty about the coronavirus and concerns about its transmission, some panicked owners feel they have no choice but to abandon their pets. 
But one vet actually encourages owners to take their pets with them for stress relief. That is, if they can keep from petting them. My advice is do not hug and kiss the dogs because they may carry the droplets with coronavirus. That doesn't mean the dog is sick, but it can be a carrier. Animal Defender has helped 40 pet dogs and a handful of cats since they began last month. Donnie says pets are usually returned upon their owner's recovery. He doesn't think the scariest part of the job is catching COVID. Instead, it's when he finds out that an owner has died, meaning their pets are abandoned for good. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.